Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Christine Woody, and I am uh, the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator with Empower Missouri. Empower Missouri, as many of you know, is a statewide nonprofit organization that does uh, policy advocacy and community education on a, a wide range of social welfare issues, uh, criminal justice, affordable housing, and food in insecurity and food security. Um, are the three issues we mostly focus on. And for decades and decades and decades, our St. Louis and Kansas City chapters specifically have held once a month educational um, community forums on a different topic. Um, before COVID, our St. Louis and our Kansas City chapters would hold those forums in person. Um, and we have been doing that for a very long time, like I had said. Um, since COVID, we moved these forums online and, and kind of combined together St. Louis and Kansas City um, to just do one um, educational event um, each month. Uh, this spring 2021, our educational forum kind of overall um, focus has been on the topic of how all politics are local, really connecting how everything is really localized, right? Everything that happens really affects us individually in our local communities. Um, and this is our last one in this series. Um, and this one is going to really kind of bubble out to what's happening in the federal level, what happens in Washington, D.C., and how it affects us here, um, St. Louis and Kansas City, but even all across in communities across Missouri. Um, and that's a huge topic, right? There's lots of things that happen in D.C. that affect us locally. So we decided to kind of boil it down just a little bit more to specifically talking today about housing policy. Um, how the policies and the funding that happen in Washington, D.C., how they are affecting our local communities um, today. And that's what we're focusing on um, during this hour um, forum that we have with us today. Uh, I'm going to introduce the three expert panelists that we have uh, today, and then I will let each of them speak. And then we will do some question and answer at the end. Um, at the end, I will also um, provide you the information if you need a continuing education credits. Um, we can offer an hour of continuing ed credits for social workers. Um, so I will put that information um, on how to obtain that certificate at the end. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our uh, panelists today. First, we have Olivia Arena. She is a housing advocacy organizer with the National Low Income Housing Coalition and their field team. Um, she previously spent the last four years conducting place-based social and economic policy research at the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Priority Center at the Urban Institute. It's a nonprofit research organization based in Washington, D.C. She graduated from the University of Texas at Austin, where she earned her bachelor's degree in international relations global studies and urban studies. And she's going to give us the big picture of what's happening um, in Washington, DC. And then after she speaks, um, we have two uh, local advocates. One is Markea Watson. She is the executive director of the Greater Kansas City Coalition to End Homelessness. As a homeless advocate, Markea's goal is to engage community partners in open and honest dialogue about the conditions that cause homelessness and real world strategies to end it. Markea has her master's in social work from the University of Kansas. And finally, we have Lee Camp. He is the senior staff attorney at Art City Defenders, which is a civil rights nonprofit law firm in St. Louis. His legal practice consists of assisting low income, elderly and disabled clients in addressing various legal housing needs, including increasing access to affordable and federally subsidized housing, preventing evictions and fighting against housing discrimination, and advocating for those currently experiencing homelessness. He has his JD from St. Louis University and a BA from the University of Arkansas. So we welcome all three of our panelists today. We are going to start with Olivia to kind of give the general history and background and the current state of a federal policy in terms of um, housing. So Olivia, I think you said you were gonna share your screen and feel free to begin. Yeah, I plan to let me know if this always works. Okay. 
You can see my slides on federal housing policy. Yeah. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I think <clears throat> this should be a good lead in, but I really want to leave time for the folks on the ground because I completely agree. As a member of our field team, um, you know, we are out talking to community advocates and state and local advocacy organizations. Um, and in some ways, learning from the field and in other ways, translating those resources up and those experiences up to the federal level. So the first thing I wanna say is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about federal housing policy, what we've seen you know, in the past, the importance of affordable housing, where we are in the pandemic and kind of what we see as long-term housing solutions. But you know, this is something that is constantly evolving. And I think it, our campaigns continue to get more practical, important and grounded when we learn from folks on the ground. So I'm excited for your questions. And I'll put my email in the chat at the end of this presentation because I also really appreciate feedback. So the first thing, and maybe y'all are already aware of this, but here at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, we really want to emphasize that having an affordable home that is safe, decent and accessible is central to all other areas of life. So people are healthier, economic productivity is increased, student outcomes are improved when families are housed in affordable homes. And we know that before COVID and the eviction crisis that we're seeing today, that we were in a housing affordability crisis. So we know that this is unprecedented. We know millions of households are living on the brink of housing instability or paying more than they should be on rent. We also know that that leaves renters with the very lowest incomes with little left over for emergencies or for savings or for investing. And it increases the risk of housing instability and potentially homelessness. So we know that this isn't an urban issue that actually we see this across the country in urban and rural communities. There's actually no county, and I'll show you some of our data and reporting that is really helpful in advocacy. There's actually no county in the United States where someone working minimum wage can afford a two bedroom apartment. Um, it's just not possible. So here at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, for those that aren't familiar, we're a national advocacy organization. And while there are many national organizations focused on federal policy, we're unique in that our organization represents the lowest income renters, um, extremely low income and very low income renters. And we focus on these income groups because that's where our research shows the greatest need. And these are the communities that have faced marginalization over the past um, history. We also think that by providing targeted resources to these income groups, we actually alleviate housing pressures up the ladder. So while I'm not gonna talk a lot about home ownership or middle income housing, um, we do believe that by targeting our resources and our efforts that we can actually alleviate pressures higher up that ladder. And that's not to say that I don't care, it's just where our focus is. So we're a membership organization. We represent the voices of various members across the housing movement. So we have homeless service providers, landlords, housing authorities, and actually residents um, or low-income tenants are, make up our membership and inform our policy. And so I've talked a little bit about why we focus on the lowest income renters. One of the reports that we put out is the GAP report that talks about the gap between the need and the availability of affordable and available homes. So we know that extremely low income renters are spending more than 50% of their income on rent. This graph here from our GAP report shows that actually 72.5% of extremely low income renters are spending 50% of their income, which means they have very little left over for any emergencies, um, any, they might have to be making sacrifices with food or education. So it's a tenuous living environment. Um, and we see as incomes increase in higher brackets that that percentage of housing, of severely housing cost burdened um, households actually decreases. The next slide kind of shows this more. When I say affordable and available, for example, we know that there are 10.8 million households that are extremely low income. And that means that they're making 30% or below of the area median income. We also know that there are only 7.4 units available and affordable to those income groups. So already we're seeing a gap of about 3.4 million units. At this income range, it's the only income group where there is an absolute shortage. So as you move up the income ladder, 
So middle income folks can still afford those units that are cheaper. They can spend less on their rent. Whereas if you have less already in your bank account, you can't afford rents at a higher price point or you're really stretching to make that work. So overall, we estimate that there are around 7 million affordable and available units missing. That's what the gap is for extremely low income renters. And it's not about just supply, although I'll continue to talk about this as a priority throughout um, the presentation. We also know that wages have not kept up with housing costs. So this is really where we see the intersection of work, labor, and housing. Um, the fact is that wages have remained stagnant, especially for lower income jobs, um, lower wage jobs, and rents have increased due to um, an inadequate supply of affordable housing across our country. So this is a map of the housing wage in states across the US. This is how much someone needs to be work making to work 40 hours a week and afford a two bedroom. So you can look at this wage and then what your state's minimum wage is and see already what that gap is um, and what folks can afford and reasonably work 40 hours a week. This is what it looks like in Missouri. So this is a snapshot of what housing is. 27% of renter households are at that extremely low income range. And the shortage, and, and I actually think this is helpful. When I say extremely low income, and I was talking about median income, it's about $25,000 for a family of four, trying to make ends meet, trying to afford rental um, units and have something saved over to provide for families. As far as that supply issue in Missouri, there's a shortage of about 122,000 rental units. Um, affordable and available to extremely low income renters. And again, if renters are able to find housing, 65% of those extremely low income renters are spending more than 50% of their income. And you're probably thinking about, you know, who are these folks? If you look at the graph on the left, most people are in the labor force, they're seniors or they're disabled. So that's, you know, to dispel the myth that folks aren't working, um, it's actually that they are working and they're just not making enough and housing costs and the supply are inadequate. So when folks don't have enough money and they're spending more than half of their income on housing, they have to make sacrifices. Like I've mentioned, they have to either skip utility bills, they have to cut back on health care, maybe not taking prescriptions, taking on an additional job, cutting back on healthy foods. So this is really where we see that intersection of housing and many other social and economic problems. So when we talk about food insecurity, we also need to be talking about the cost of housing. When we talk about the cost of health care, we need to look and see what trade-offs families are making. So this is kind of the picture that we see right now and enter the policy arena um, in. Now, federal housing policy is incredibly broad, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but here's some of the milestones. So right, this really HUD and the federal programs um, that we're really familiar with, these federal programs that now make up HUD really began in the 1930s with construction and finance programs that were meant to alleviate some of the housing pressures caused by the Great Depression. So the Federal Housing Administration was uh, created in 1934. The Housing um, Act of 1937 initiated the construction of public housing which we still feel is an incredible asset. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when we think about long-term goals, initiated the construction of public housing, um, the creation of a cabinet level agency, HUD, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development was in 1965. And the Fair Housing Act um, of 1968 really was meant as a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that um, prohibited discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, or sex. And I'll talk also a little bit about how we believe that the Fair Housing Act actually needs to be expanded to include other renter protections. And then ultimately, and this is again alluding to that state and local importance, the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 made significant changes to housing programs and focused more on block grants um, and increased to local authority versus arbitrating all of these programs at the national level. So this is really the devolution of authority that said, you know what states, you need to help build housing and you need to pass housing policy. And we're gonna really give you the reins um, 
This is kind of what led to some of the programs that we see, like the origin of tenant and project-based Section 8 and rental assistance programs. Um, because I'm going to talk a little bit about public housing later. These are, let's see if this advances, there you go. Public housing is the oldest and until recently the largest housing subsidy program in the country. Uh, there's about 1.1 million units of public housing operated across 3,000 local public housing agencies and serving about 2.2 million re uh, residents. But again, there haven't been an adequate investments made in public housing, which is one of the few resources for the lowest income Americans. So here's kind of a timeline of what is essentially has been a repositioning of public housing, a lack of investment, and ultimately converting public housing now to the private market, which is what we see the trend is. And I'll put links to some of these and background information in the chat after I finish speaking. So that brings us to where we are today, right? There have been resources that are created, these housing programs. Um, often at the federal level, they reinforce segregation, even when they were meant to support the lowest income Americans. There's been a lack of investment over time in housing as a resource. And because of that, actually only one in four um, eligible renters receives rental assistance, right? It's not like um, it's not like some of the other programs like SNAP or TANF, where just because you're eligible, you receive rental assistance. And that's where you're met with folks saying, I've been on the waiting list for a voucher. I can't get into a unit. There's just not enough supply and we haven't really prioritized it in the same level of an entitlement or a necessity, which brings us to our policy priorities. I do wanna say that we are a nonpartisan organization and we support any good housing policy, regardless of what side of the aisle it comes from, because we believe that good housing policy affects every person and every community across the political spectrum. So we are willing to work with anyone and we also pivot, pivoted, especially in the last year, to addressing the housing crisis as we've seen it evolve. So much of our last year has really been dedicated to emergency measures and some of our key priorities have been addressed in the COVID-19 relief package passed in December and the American Rescue Plan. Um, and while those are incredible investments and I will talk about them in a moment, we do wanna say that just because a lot of money has been spent on housing recently does not mean that we have solved the affordable housing crisis. That funding and those protections are meant to help renters struggling right now, but there are many renters and often those same renters that were struggling pre-pandemic. So we don't want there to be a fatigue of spending because we actually have a lot of work to do to solve the underlying crisis. So during the pandemic, some of the emergency actions that were passed at the federal level include, include emergency rental assistance. So this is money for housing choice voucher. Uh, this is money for renters who have maybe not caught up on their back rent, as well as some of their forward rent who need help with utilities, um, suffered loss during the pandemic. We've seen close to $50 billion allocated through an emergency rental assistance program. And that's pretty amazing. There hasn't been one at the national level that's been passed or codified in this way. We've also advocated for increased housing vouchers, funding for homeless services, and ultimately for a federal eviction moratorium, which we saw the CDC pass in the fall of last year, we've continued to advocate for it to be strengthened, for it to be enforced, and for it to be extended. And so now that CDC eviction moratorium um, is extended through June 30th. I will acknowledge that if you keep up on housing news, there's been a recent um, challenge in DC uh, district court. Um, there's a stay on it right now. So renters are protected, but that is gonna be something that continues to be litigated. And it also emphasizes that while the federal eviction moratorium might be in contention, state and local eviction moratoria are still standing. So that's where it's really important for state and local advocates to pass additional protections at their state level, um, such as local moratoria. So long-term, I've kind of alluded to this throughout, but we kind of think of long-term solutions in five big buckets. So bridging that gap between incomes and housing costs, as I mentioned, right now, working minimum wage, you really can't afford housing um, for many of the most common jobs in America. We wanna expand and preserve the supply of affordable housing, both in the private sector and in the public sector, um, in public housing. So what does it take to reinvest, to invest in that resource? We wanna prevent evictions and housing instability because we know that that can often lead folks into homelessness. And we wanna ensure equitable disaster recovery. So if you're in the Gulf Coast, you're hit by hurricanes, that diminishes the housing stock 
And also you might be losing an incredible amount of resources that you need um, to stay stably housed. And finally, expanding, addressing fair housing and racial and income equity. So we wanna expand renter protections and we wanna do all of this with a mindfulness that the folks in our country who have been most marginalized and discriminated against are people of color. So there needs to be an intentional focus on building in racial equity and community-based learning and leadership and capacity building in any of these programs. So something we're championing is the house campaign. This is moving from that recovery, that disaster mode and pivoting to the long term. COVID shone a light on housing as essential to public health. It also, we're, you know, we're in an unprecedented time where there might be an appetite for big housing spending. Um, so we really wanna capitalize on that right now and advance anti-racist policies that are gonna achieve large scale um, housing success. So an example of this is universal rental assistance. We want um, renters who are eligible, who are right to receive the rental assistance that they're eligible for. So like I said, one in four renters who are eligible don't receive assistance. We believe this could be expanded and should be expanded. We wanna increase and preserve the supply of affordable homes. Um, we wanna provide emergency rental assistance to households in crisis. So we saw how important that emergency rental assistance was to folks staying housed during the pandemic. And then we want to establish vital renter protections. Here's a little bit more granularity, and I will post a link to this in the chat because it's a lot to go through. But here are some examples of how we believe housing assistance could be made available to all eligible households. Expanding and guaranteeing funding for housing choice vouchers. So what does it look like to make sure that universal vouchers are provided to everyone that falls within a certain income range? What does it mean to offer them choice in the private sector to go out and be able to live in the housing that they choose. We also think that it could look like a creating a renter's tax credit to cover rental costs. Um, and again, moving housing assistance to the mandatory side of spending so that it's not up to discretionary allocations, but instead it's really treated as the priority that it is. When I'm talking about supply, um, preserving and supply, the increase and in, increasing the supply of affordable housing, recognizing that right now the underlying cause in America's housing crisis is a market failure. The private sector is not building affordable housing for the lowest income Americans because they have the lowest income. They're not at market rate. So we want to expand something like the National Housing Trust to include at least $40 billion annually. Um, the National Housing Trust, again, this is where the emphasis on state and local um, advocacy comes in. That's administered as a block grant. So states decide how to prioritize that. And actually in another presentation I gave to a group in Missouri, folks brought up the need to invest in preserving rural housing, that's aging stock. So this is something that would be advocated and planned at the local level with federal resources. Um, we believe that there needs to be at least 70 billion invested in preserving and rehabilitating public housing and ultimately emphasizing the increase in construction in public housing. An emergency stabilization fund will look could look like establishing rental assistance programs for households in crisis, similar to what we already saw at the federal level. So this could look like a housing stabilization fund. Um, an example of this is an eviction crisis act, which helped households that were at risk um, of facing eviction. And finally, we believe in strengthening and enforcing renter protections. So maybe Lee will talk more about what this looks like in um, Missouri, but We've seen states and localities across the country pass some level of these renter protections. One thing that we think is essential is prohibiting source of income discrimination so that folks can't be turned away based on how they're paying for their housing. Establishing and funding a national right to counsel so that tenants are entitled to representation in court. Creating just cause eviction protections so that your lease can't be terminated with short-term notice and for just any reason. And expanding the Fair Housing Act to include, um, to ban discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, and source of income, which are currently not included. So um, we believe these resources need to be provided to everyone, regardless of immigration status, that we need to prioritize, like I said, communities that have been marginalized historically. And ultimately, we think these policies are mutually reinforcing. So in the example of vouchers, we need to increase the supply of vouchers so that more households who are eligible can have them. We need to increase the supply of units that those 
vouchers can be used in, but we also need to prohibit those voucher holders from being discriminated against just because they make fewer, well, less money. So that's how we kind of see these pillars working in tandem. And this is where we see the future of housing policy. So we are looking at different vehicles for this to be passed. And you might've heard about the American Jobs Plan. That's the big infrastructure package being touted by the Biden administration. We actually believe that housing is infrastructure. It's not just bricks. It's not just roads. Um, it's not just bridges. It's actually housing as an asset. So we've been advocating for this language and these priorities to be put into that package and emphasized. And we're actually seeing a lot of traction um, on the Hill. But if you'd like to sign on to our letter for your organization, I'll put a link again in the chat. And if you're so compelled by my presentation to join NLIHC, like I said, we're a membership organization. Um, members are our strength. And outside of membership, we're also a convener. So you don't have to be a member to attend a, num a number of our working group calls to talk about your experience on the ground, to provide feedback, to have me come and speak at your meetings. Um, so I'll put my information, but we always ask folks that if you're interested in becoming more involved, you can also look at options for membership. Here's my information. Um, I'll be here for question and answer. Um, like I said, we see this as a pivotal moment in housing policy. We've seen an increase in political will. And ultimately, we at the national level, and also many of you probably on the call, and I'm sure the other speakers already know what many of the solutions are to housing and homelessness um, in our country. Um, we just need the political will to pass big policy to uh, rectify some of the wrongs that we've seen in housing policy in the past. So thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, let's turn to our other local speakers and then we'll do kind of question and answer with everyone um, at the end. Um, so Markeo, do you wanna start us off? Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, I was asked to talk about um, just in general, you know, our pandemic response and how we've utilized federal, federal resources to create or strengthen um, our housing system and to ensure that those um, who are living in unsheltered or um, homeless shelter situations um, have the ability to um, socially distance and remain safe. It's been an interesting journey. I think <laughs> at the beginning of all of this, um, in March 15th or so of last year, um, we had a planning group sit down over the weekend and just kind of talk about, because we really didn't know at that time what was even happening. Um, we knew we had just gotten back from the um, National Alliance to End Homelessnesses Conference in California and knew from being in California that it was very clear that whatever this COVID-19 was, it was a real legitimate thing and something that we credibly needed to fear. And so, of course, working in the homeless sector, our initial impulse is to think if there's a deadly viral pandemic in our midst, then those who are most medically vulnerable, um, you know, and who don't have housing are most likely to be hit the hardest. So we sat down and started kind of theorizing based on some guidance from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, um, from the pandemic response um, that Seattle King County had created around the SARS outbreak, um, which was quite some time ago and not the most current information, but provided a great framework to start from. And then the only thing that we could think of at that scale that really would have displaced a lot of people at one time into homelessness and exacerbated everyone's homelessness was Hurricane Katrina. So we went back through all of the archives to figure out what in the world did they do during Katrina? What areas of emphasis did they focus on to ensure that people had some semblance of housing stability? Um, and so we came up with some buckets and we knew that while we're thinking about the homeless, you know, the unsheltered homeless in particular, that there's a high risk that more people are going to start dumping into homelessness very quickly. And we were kind of thinking we're going to be in this avalanche type of scenario. And this was before the federal rental assistance and before the moratoria existed. So we got a planning committee together, talked about just in the long term, what would we do around eviction? What if 40,000 new households were to become evicted all at one time? Because clearly people weren't going to work. 
Um, and it was starting to happen very quickly that our most fragile families were presenting to the emergency system first, um, which I think Olivia alluded to that those folks who are already on the razor's edge were pushed right over that precipice right at the outset of COVID-19. Um, we were thinking about folks who are non-native English speakers or undocumented, those families who are being underserved, thinking about the disease itself. And, you know, at that time, not even being able to get people tested and how are we going to keep people socially distant and still be able to deliver services to them. We noticed immediately that eviction was becoming a problem and that our folks that suffer with severe mental health um, who, you know, may have tenuous employment or no employment at all, were just spiraling the drain immediately. Um, and that we had to start thinking very quickly on our feet about how to get the band together and figure out what in the world we were gonna do. Some of the folks that were involved in that work early on are actually on this call. And then we had Sarah from Empower Missouri who we consider our community's housing guru. Um, she came alongside to help us to figure out how to quantify this issue. Because we don't, we didn't even know kind of what size or scale of a problem we were talking about. So we kept in our minds this number forty thousand families that we're looking at potentially forty thousand families that are going to be very high risk based on what we know about extremely low income families vis-a-vis um, -vis the rental market. The other thing is that we already have a shortage of housing units in this community, and that preceded COVID nineteen. And we're not talking about just the affordability question, but really about quality and dignity in housing, proximity to people's jobs and to schools and all of those things that are important um, for families to stay stable in their housing, but also to be able to manage um, the expense of being there. With the federal money, the initial kind of push was really toward creating crisis housing for people who were unsheltered or who were presumed positive with COVID-19 and had nowhere to shelter in place once they were tested. And so we utilized that money to commission a hotel to use some of its rooms so that we could block them off as an isolation housing intervention. While we worked with our partners at the Salvation Army and some other service providers to create an isolation center. And that was utilizing um, federal dollars that were allocated to us from Jackson County. So we operated this isolation housing program for about three months and then found that strangely our population was not being impacted to the degree that we suspected it would by COVID-19. And that rather than focus on just that piece of the crisis response and you know blow all of our resources there that we really did need to start thinking about permanent housing. Since then, a lot has shifted. So there's been a lot more federal resources that have come into the community, which we've been utilizing to ramp up our homeless prevention and street outreach efforts. It's the first time in recent memory that our community has had a comprehensive and robust street outreach game plan, and that we have providers working together to engage folks around housing and not just to feed them or clothe them in the field. Um, with that, we've started connecting folks to additional resources that they or entitlements that they might not have been aware that they're eligible for. So connecting people to their stimulus payments, for example. Um, and some folks that we've seen that were living outside were able to maneuver with that infusion of cash to actually get themselves off the streets and self-resolve their own homelessness. Um, we've been in the process of transitioning a hotel into a navigation center. Um, the hotel navigation center model is an idea that we stole from San Francisco, California. And, you know, at the beginning, this was all just kind of ideas on paper. We're like, wouldn't it be cool if we could blah, 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 you know, and then all of a sudden you have this infusion of money that, you know, or you pray is going to be a one-time opportunity to do something big and kind of swing for the fences. Um, so we're in the process of transitioning a hotel. It's a hotel that has 39 units. Um, into emergency housing. So it'll be flexible. Um, so it can operate as emergency shelter. It can operate as transitional housing. You could attach section eight vouchers to it for a project-based model. Um, you could use it for medical respite, whatever the kind of need is. Um, we've been working with our tenant advocacy groups and our legal aid groups to really figure out what in the world we're going to do about all these evictions. And despite the moratoria, the eviction wheels keep on rolling. 
And, you know, people are being thrown out onto the street for all manner of reasons outside of non-payment of rent, some of which are manufactured, some of which are just straight up illegal, you know, and so trying to figure out how can we coordinate between housing providers and social services with our legal defense teams who don't do housing work, they do anti-eviction and anti-homelessness work, but they're not social workers, they're not therapists, and they're being tasked with doing kind of all of those things um, in an office or courtroom setting. And so that initial planning group first started working with Missouri Legal Aid and the Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom and Kansas Legal Aid, because we, we straddle um, two states in our continuum of care, to think about how we could couple our resources together to increase our impact and to be able to leverage our expertise. Um, and so prior to this large chunk of US Treasury money, we were utilizing our resources through the ESG program, the Emergency Solutions Grant Program of HUD, to make that synergy with our legal defense folks. We created a universal um, technology application platform so that everybody who needed rental assistance you know, in the immediate could apply through one portal. And since the U.S. Treasury dollars have been deployed, we've ramped up that platform and created something that really is a robust data platform. And the coolest thing that's kind of emerging out of this is that predictive analysis around homelessness is a hard thing to do because it isn't simply because people are poor that they're homeless. There are factors that are driving the poverty. There are factors that are driving social exclusion and alienation. There's relationship dynamics that drive homelessness. There's race that drives homelessness. And so if you just look at it in terms of dollars and cents, you can kind of come up with, you know, a theory around the scope of people that might be able or that might be at risk of homelessness. But because of this federal rental assistance and how many people who need it and how disparate they are, um, we have for the first time in our community, a data set that we can utilize to start predicting homelessness, to start predicting what the tipping point looks like for households and demographically what their characteristics might be so that we can start to draw some distinctions around what's the difference between one family who you know misses a paycheck and another family who misses a paycheck but then becomes homeless. Um, we're talking about transitioning hotels into permanent housing and looking at a single room occupancy model for our community. It's one of the types of housing that we don't have. We're definitely shy of single and one bedroom apartments. And the predominant um, demographic group in our homeless population is single individuals who don't have minor children. Um, they're placed at a disadvantage in a lot of ways um, in the emergency shelter system. They don't always have the ability to access shelter, especially women who don't have kids um, appear to be punished for not having made that choice. And there's not a lot of opportunities for them. And so transitioning hotels would give us flexible housing that we could shift in four to six weeks. We could turn a hundred unit hotel property into a hundred units of housing and utilize federal home dollars to do that, which for the first time in forever includes supportive services, which are critical, especially after having come out of a global crisis. We've also utilized the money to talk about racial equity and to educate our community and our neighbors about how race impacts this work, how race impacts um, people's housing stability, their upward mobility, their ability to transfer wealth to their children through home ownership, all of those issues that in the end, um, you know, are driving this homeless problem. And then bringing people with lived expertise into those conversations and having them help us to define what type of housing, what standard of housing, um, what kind of amenities they want and need and where they'd like their housing to be situated. Um, and then our KCMO government, they've put uh, in this kind of first tranche of, of federal relief funds, they're looking at a housing trust nowhere near as juicy as I had hoped, but they are looking at creating a housing trust for Kansas City, Missouri. They're ramping up their efforts around tenant advocacy. They've actually created a, a Bureau of Tenant Advocacy at, the, at City Hall, which is cool. Um, and then they're working on a larger scale rental relief program that will be local and increasing their efforts around um, homelessness or anti-homelessness work. The conversation around you know, shoring up our housing resources across the board is not happening to scale. And I'm just going to be very clear about that, that, you know, we can't credibly do the work that we do to prevent and end homelessness if we're not 
also talking about housing production and about, you know, creating housing opportunities. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, increased advocacy in this realm um, at our municipal and state level, as much as at the federal level, will really help us to get there because we most certainly are not there. Lee, do you want to take the mic? Sure. Yeah. I'll take it from there. Um, thank you. And it, hearing that, I, you might as well hold a mirror up to Kansas City and those same discussions and problems are happening here on the ground. Um, again, my name is Lee Camp. I am an attorney. So this has been a particularly difficult week, and I apologize if I'm a little off. Um, as Olivia mentioned, the CDC moratorium did come under fire, um, and a rapid number of changes happened in about a 12-hour period on Wednesday that I've been working through, and um, we're gearing up for litigation around that. But I, I think what I can bring here that hasn't maybe been discussed is kind of point out um, a few specific examples of where we're seeing that federal those federal relief packages that have already been passed and are now being implemented locally, how they're playing out, and then talk about kind of the, the different campaign priorities that the National Low Income Housing Coalition is working on in this future of housing, how we think about it big, how we think about it in an anti-racist sense, um, and how we get involved as advocates at the local level as these federal conversations are happening as well. Um, so I think what might be best for me is to focus on three things that have happened in the pandemic tangibly, and those are the rental assistance programs that are rolling out in the St. Louis community, the moratoriums that exist here, have existed, have expired, and what they look like now, and then to, to speak about source of income for a moment, because we do have a source of income protection in St. Louis City. So on the rental assistance front, it's been very interesting, you know, and, and when the CARES Act passed last summer and instituted this initial eviction moratorium um, and, and gave money for rental assistance in a way that we had not seen in this country, uh, it was a very interesting kind of project where I was taking off my legal hat and putting on my policy hat and working with city and county officials in the St. Louis area to try to design a program that, that frankly didn't exist and we had no blueprint or compass to use from any other jurisdictions. And I was on those weekly um, NLIHC calls, just listening for any tip that could work here. And what we found is we designed a system to push out millions of dollars under the CARES Act that eventually did make its way to the streets, but did not make it into the hands of tenants or landlords in nearly an efficient enough manner, in a fast enough manner. Um, and it's because we use kind of our old system of thinking. We pass money, through our traditional nonprofit system that relied on service providers that are already under resourced to make connection points with individuals and, and really administer a program that was brand new. And so while the CARES Act money was successful and it did stabilize some individuals, um, what we do know is that, or what we knew in December is that if new rental assistance money came online through either the December COVID relief package or um, what did happen with the American Rescue Plan and both those bills, actually about $50 billion combined rental assistance came online, we knew the programs had to look different. And we knew that because we are the local advocates that are closest to the issues on the ground. As Olivia mentioned, you know, we were filling out those applications. The social workers in my office were helping people navigate those issues. And we knew that we needed more centralized kind of coordination. We needed easier literal easier applications for people to fill out, um, both tenants and landlords. We knew we needed to get landlords a ton more info to get them to participate in the programs. And we've even fallen short there as we've rolled out our new ones so far. And we'll have to change that and recalibrate for the American Rescue Plan money that is coming online. And we just got guidance from the Treasury about an hour or two ago um, on that money. So Really, I think that that's a, a very good example of where we have to plug in. We don't have an option at this point um, as advocates working with this population. We must be communicating with our policymakers and our lawmakers locally um, be, because, you know, Congress has put some, some strings and sure enough, there were bureaucratic trade-offs that happened to get that rental assistance money out. But really, the implementation that takes place is either at the state level 
or if you're in a large city like Kansas City or St. Louis or St. Louis County, those larger um, metropolitan areas, the local government is the one that ends up pushing the money out. And it ends up making those connection points to people that need it the most. And so I, I say we don't have an option. We really didn't. We had to be at the table and we had to explain the hardships that people were having that we were hearing on a daily basis. And it has been successful in crafting systems that have worked better um, or we hope will be more successful. Time will only tell if we've done everything wrong on the back end of this. But certainly if you listen to the peoples and, and the communities that are being impacted the most and take those concerns to your local governments, you know, they, they do listen when you uplift those stories. And um, we have found it effective to take very pointed examples of what is happening on the ground to our policymakers and are now seeing those changes incorporated into the way um, this, this last kind of round of rental assistance will flow into the community. Um, there was a point about the, the CDC, and I've brought it up already too, that it is under attack at the federal level. But Olivia mentioned that we could look to the state government or we could look to local governments to protect us there. Well, as anyone knows, it's been touching the housing space um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Governor Parson, the legislature, the Missouri Supreme Court, our entire you know, state government branch, they, they have all turned um, their eyes away from this problem that we have and have refused to act here. And so fortunately we have had a federal government even going back to the Trump administration that was somewhat receptive to these concerns about the eviction crisis. And then our local governments here in St. Louis City and St. Louis County have also been acutely aware that the, the mass level of evictions we're looking at in such an expedited period of time would turn into mass homelessness into the streets. There, there's no doubt about it. And so what we have had is we had local court protections um, prior to the implementation of the CDC's administrative order. Um, but now what we have seen in the past month is St. Louis County's local legislature, the county council, actually has passed its own eviction moratorium. Sure, it's likely subject to a legal challenge. It could be preempted by state law. But on Wednesday, when the CDC the federal moratorium came under attack. There was at least a local moratorium, another hurdle that landlords that wanted to evict in this moment were going to have to overcome and another legal battle that they would have to engage in. Um, so it, it's almost like you take some of these federal policies that are successful and we absolutely unequivocally know that the ev federal eviction moratorium has saved families from being evicted and saved lives. Well, our, our county council, our local government essentially just endorsed that and passed their own version and mirror of a federal law. And it adds another layer of protections for individuals locally. This is something we can be asking for all across the state and really all around this country. And I think we are starting to see that happen. Um, certainly Wednesday was an alarm for any community that had not had something like that in place. And I believe this morning, in St. Louis City, there was a bill introduced to essentially put into place a local law um, suspending evictions through the end of September here. So you can see how these things that are federal policies, again, are taking place, really are, are put into action, or at least being endorsed by our local governments. And I think that's really important as well. And then when we think of source of income protections as a protected class for discrimination purposes under the Fair Housing Act, well, the city of St. Louis has had a source of income protection for a long time. Source of income, what we mean by that traditionally is meant you cannot discriminate against a family based on the way that they receive income to pay for their housing. Uh, particularly with rental housing, that would be discriminating against families that have Section 8 or housing choice vouchers. Um, unexpectedly, one thing that we have begun to, to shift and think about, um, particularly as a litigator, I think about this in the fair housing context, is the denial of rental assistance, um, federal rental assistance as an income source to pay rent could possibly fall under source of income protections that we have in the city of St. Louis. And while this is not a, a federal protection, we have seen source of income um, protections be implemented in communities hundreds of communities around this country. Um, and it's almost an inverse of the federal government 
you know, us implementing local things based on federal policy, the, the kind of groundswell and up, you know, movement around source of income at local governments has now made its way to federal policymakers and lawmakers. And now there is a robust discussion about expanding these uh, protections. And so it, it, it works both ways at times. We can see these successful uh, programs that happen and laws that are working in our communities be lifted up in the other way to the federal government. And particularly right now where we do have a, a Congress that seems receptive, these successful policies, we should be talking and engaging with our Congress people and our senators to let them know what is working in our community right now, um, particularly as there are these large groups like the Low Income Housing Coalition that are putting heavy lobbying pressure on right now in DC. They need to hear, you know, to help those efforts, they need to hear stories from the ground that are working. And we are the best poised to lift those up directly to our local elected officials and those in, in Congress right now. Um, to, to talk about the future, you know, I think the, the most immediate need in front of us right now comes from the American Rescue Plan where our local governments um, here in St. Louis are receiving combined over $600 million in money to rethink the way we recover from the pandemic, right? And we in the city of St. Louis, it's about $500 million. In the county, it's about $170 million. Um, the, the way that those funds are being administered are different in each jurisdiction in the county and the city, uh, but both are receiving community input and they have no option but to do it. You can call every council person um, that is, you know, your elected official and let them know that you want housing to be a priority as we spend this money and to think long term, not simply about recovery. This is money that certainly was earmarked for recovery. But it is money that can build, you know, a new future in the way that we think about housing in a, a really progressive manner in this country and an anti-racist manner. You know, the, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 is probably the least realized piece of all of the civil rights litigation or legislation in the 60s. And so right now, is no, there's no better time than right now to make sure that fair housing and that housing is being discussed at every single level of our government, including our local governments, as they think about how they'll dole out these millions of dollars that have flown in uh, seemingly overnight to these governments. And I know in the city of St. Louis, there's the mayor's office is openly asking for this feedback and has a forum to communicate it to her. In the county, all of our county elected officials are hearing every day from individuals um, about how this money should be used. And I would, I would say um, one point that came up that's happening in Kansas City that's happening here, there's a lot of collaboration happening right now among groups. You know, I, I work with a lot of individuals that are not attorneys, that are just service providers and things like that. And we've been working to collaborate in our ask for money to be dedicated to these housing needs. And one thing that's effective is that collaboration and to take these kind of shovel ready projects that can be implemented immediately with some concrete specificity to, um, to your local elected officials and, and demand and give, just give them a, an outline of exactly how you're going to use the money and how effective it will be as it moves forward. And then I think about things like right to counsel, you know, the, these ideas that are going around, Maybe we don't get a federal right to counsel program, or maybe we do see right to counsel, you know, within the next few years being endorsed by the federal government. Uh, but we don't know what that would look like. And we know from experience around the country that it's really important that you engage locally around something like right to counsel, where, um, you know, your local government may say, we're going to create a right to counsel program. And, and there are discussions around this in St. Louis, absolutely. Um, but what does that look like? Who actually is covered by that right? How is it paid for? Those type things. We need to engage as advocates in those conversations because we are best poised to build those systems. Um, even if the, if the right to counsel program is you know, endorsed by the federal government and they said, we're gonna send all these cities $200 million to do this every year, that's great. Um, but how is that money actually put into action? We are the ones that need to design those programs and work with our elected officials 
locally to do so. So that's kind of what I have, thoughts of what's been going on, thoughts of how we can improve as we move forward. Um, and I think I'll turn it over to you, Christine, to, to wrap us up. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Does anyone have any questions that we want to address um, the last few minutes that we have before we wrap up today? in the chat that I can talk about. I don't, you know, as far as seeing a future for more public housing projects, you know, I think that there has been, you know, maybe this is, there's been a lot of messaging and media around like what public housing is. And I think that folks don't under, largely, you know, don't understand the resource that public housing is and what it's meant to serve and that it's not just you know, what's in media, that actually there are a lot of supports from the Department of Housing and Urban Development that are meant to meet need. Um, you know, that vouchers are issued, Section 8 vouchers are issued by public housing um, authorities, and that largely there needs to be increased investment and rehabilitation of pro uh, public housing projects. And also, I had this on a slide, but repealing the Faircloth Amendment would mean that you could actually build additional units. And while that might you know, not happen immediately, um, or that limit might not be what's really hindering some places. I think it's a, a recommitment to public housing as seeing it as an asset. And right now, just like an acknowledgement that there's not, um, not adequate supply of housing and that we need, and like I said, that there's a market failure. It's never gonna be created by the private market because public housing is meant to be for the folks that, you know, aren't captured by, that private market that are, you know, the lowest income or most marginalized. So, I mean, I do see more, I think we are seeing more like language and messaging around it and more of an appetite um, for it. But I do think like largely, you know, it suffered from, you know, be racist media characterizations um, around the programs and supports of housing. And I will just ask, answer this last question. We do believe that housing is a part of infrastructure. Um, and that it's an essential piece of, you know, what holds and binds our communities together and that it's part of like a dignified life in community and essential for, you know, for strengthening communities um, is housing. And I know that there's messaging out there that that's not the case, but that's really how we've really been seeing it as an asset in communities and hope to like reframe the conversation around housing as infrastructure. I, I would echo that. I would say on the public housing front too, you know, we we see public housing recalibrate in terms of the way that HUD wants to deal with, with existing public housing um, and rehabbing public housing. It's no secret in this country that our public housing is just not in good shape at this point and that there does need to be a major infusion of capital into that program. Um, and we have seen really over the past 10, 15 years, this kind of um, idea of dealing with public housing in a public-private type partnership, well, that's a federal, you know, policy in a way that we've dealt with some of that that stuff. Um, when when that comes to our local communities, and we are looking at taking existing public housing and putting it into these programs that are part public, part private, you know, we should be at the table for that too. We know who the private companies are that we would want running those those projects, um, not in the ones that we don't want. That is where we bring that unique perspective is on the ground advocates. And sometimes we are constrained. I would prefer that public housing remain public. That is my personal preference. That's not necessarily what the government has said, but you know, when, when those programs come to town, we may not like them, but we're still poised to tailor them to fit the needs of our community. And that's really what, what this is about as a local advocate, where I sat in a different position than where Olivia sets. Wonderful. Thank you all so much again for joining us today. Um, I put a few things in the chat. Um, if you do need continuing education credits, I put the information of how to obtain that. You just need to email me uh, your name, mailing address, and last four digits of your social security number for the records. Um, if you want a copy of Olivia's presentation, just put your email address in the chat to me as well, and I will make sure I get that emailed out to you after today's events. 
Um, there is an evaluation form for this forum. If you do not mind clicking on that link and just taking a minute or two to fill that out, we would appreciate that. Um, and then finally, as I said, this is the end of our um, kind of Friday forum um, series that we've been having, but we are going to have a forum on the first Friday of June, June 4th, and we're going to use that as a legislative session wrap up event. Um, so we will have uh, Mallory Rush, our executive director, Sarah Owsley, our policy director, and Jeremy Lefevre, who has been our lobbyist in the Capitol these last few months. Um, join us to give us a wrap up of what happened in Jefferson City on all of our policy priorities, including our affordable housing. So please join us on that Friday. There is a link in the chat to register for that event. Similar to these forums, you'll register and then you'll get a Zoom link um, to access it. So we will meet again on the first Friday of June for that event. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you, our panelists, for taking time out of your busy schedule. We really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing all of you on June 4th. Thank you.